Hi everyone, Lori here. Um, we're going to start off this week by talking about dynamic stability during gait. And I've broken up this lecture, um, the lectures this week, into part one and to part two. All right, here we go. Uh, first, before we get going, I just want to let you know we're going to be posting a frequently asked questions document um, that myself and the TAs, Hannah and Gemma, have been working on together. Um, hopefully they'll be posted by 5 p.m. Uh, tonight, Tuesday, March 24th, on Course Link. Um, in there we'll just be highlighting some of the questions that have been coming through on Course Link and through different email channels um, about the course content, about the group assignment, and video, like uploading your videos, um, and as well about the final exam. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I thought what I'd do is I'd just sort of go back in time. It feels like, like it's been a long time since we talked about like real lecture material. Um, so I thought I'll just go back and, and kind of just reiterate where we were um, at with some of these lecture slides. So first off, what's the importance of activities of daily living? Um, first off, really important for physical and social well-being. And for me, this is how I'm actually getting outside and enjoying and getting some mental health um, myself recently. And hopefully you're doing the same. So I think we'd all agree um, that there's some importance of um, walking right now um, in terms of just maintaining some maintaining some of that social and physical well-being. Uh, it's also an excellent functional test of many systems. So um, just by watching somebody walk, you can look at the interaction of multi-joint movements. Clearly, it's a dynamic action that requires adaptation as we navigate over curbs and around um, different objects in our um, environment. And it's a wonderful test of sensory motor integration. Um, so for example, an individual who perhaps uh, maybe may have diabetes that also is um, experiencing diabetic neuropathy symptoms who has a hard time uh, controlling that uh, dorsiflexion of the ankle um, during the uh, terminal phases of that um, uh, gait. So that's a really important component. So you can sort of start to look at those things from a clinical um, perspective as well. So it's a great test of many systems. It also provides insight into the development of orthotic and prosthetic design and rehab um, program evaluations and also robotics. So James Christensen, um, his talk really discuss quite in depth about orthotic and prosthetic designs and how important his gait analysis is for his clinical practice. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about robotics in today's lecture to sort of um, bring that into the discussion as well. So in class we talked um, a little bit about um, the amputee running um, of uh, Terry Fox and I won't get into that but we did actually look at the video and discuss um, sort of how, how his gait, uh, and specifically his running gait, was really affected by his prosthetic design. And, and really we talked a lot in this uh, clip about power and his ability to generate power and how that was, um, clearly his gait wasn't as efficient, so he had to develop all kinds of compensatory strategies just because his, um, his, uh, his uh, orthotic device, or his orthotic, his prosthetic device was severely limited. So, um, just to kind of get back into that headspace of talking about power, I wanted just to remind everybody about what the equation is for muscle power. So it's going to be the sum of all the moments multiplied by um, your angular velocity. And so uh, I've just used in, in class, I, I use the example of the elbow joint here just as a way to visualize what was happening. So in this particular example right now, we're using a right hand coordinate system. And let's say we've done a free body diagram and we have some kinematic data that will allow us to, to make, the, make the conclusion that we actually have a positive angular velocity here at the elbow in addition to a positive moment at the elbow. So a positive times a positive is a positive for power. So this, in fact, is going to be positive power. And that's representing concentric actions of the elbow flexors, those muscles, um, those bicep muscles here. In a similar way, we can look at the elbow extensors, so those tricep muscles back here. And you can imagine that if the arm was moving in this location, you'd have a negative moment about the elbow and a negative um, angular uh, velocity about the elbow joint. And because this is a negative times a negative, um, that's going to give us a positive power, um, just according to our uh, equation just up here. So now we've got this nice concentric contraction that's occurring from those elbow extensors of the tricep muscles. Okay, if we contrast this with a situation, again, right-hand coordinate system, where maybe we have an external force that's being applied. So this could be a shopping bag or uh, maybe somebody's pushing down on your hand. And in this case, um, the actual movement of the um, movement of the arm 
about the elbow joint is going to be in this direction. So we could use a video camera to tell us, oh wow, look, we've got this angular velocity that's going to be going in our negative direction according to our right hand rule. But when we actually do a um, when we do a free body diagram, we may be able to calculate then, well our moment is actually positive. So a positive times a negative, that's going to give us a negative um, power here. And because our primary movers are our um, in this situation is going to be our uh, bicep muscles. When we're talking about the actions about, about the bicep muscles, that's going to be an eccentric contraction. So imagine these muscles lengthening here, even though they're trying to produce this moment about, or they are producing this moment about the elbow in a positive direction, the actual motion that's occurring because of this external force is um, happening in this direction. So negative power. Um, and then we can look at that, the flip side to that external force acting up on the hand in this scenario. Um, perhaps we've got that angular velocity now occurring in a positive direction, so the arm is moving up, which is indicative of a lengthening of these elbow extensors, um, despite the fact that we've got a moment that's going to be going in the negative direction. So negative times a positive, that's going to give us a negative power. So I use this in class just to set the stage and to remind everybody um, if it's been a little while since you've thought about muscle power, um, how it's calculated. Now I wanted to um, highlight um, what's happening within the gait cycle. So just a reminder, here's the gait cycle up top on this slide. Um, and again, uh, that the first 40% um, of, uh, or yeah, the first 60% of the gait cycle is going to be the stance. And then the remainder of the 40% is going to be the swing phase of the gait cycle. So uh, just to orient to the graph below, this is power in watts per kilo, um, just normalized to to how big your participant is. And this is that percentage of the gait cycle. So once again, around 60% is when we're going into the swing phase of the gait cycle. So the very first phase of, um, of our power at the ankle is going to be termed A1. Uh, and you'll notice that this is a similar notation um, throughout all of the ankle, knee, and hip um, graphs that you're going to see in the next few slides. So A1 is a region of negative power and this is actually going to correspond to eccentric plantar flexion um, that's occurring at the ankle. So you can imagine there's the ankle joint, we've got this nice eccentric um, uh, contractions going on that's allowing that ankle to dorsiflex quite in a nice controlled manner. Um, so this is uh, a negative power because you can imagine those um, tibialis anterior muscles are going to be lengthening um, or shortening, sorry, which means that your e, your plantar flexors are lengthening. So plantar flexors are going to be doing that nice lengthening action that's occurring. Okay, at A2, this is a region of positive power, and this is going to correspond to a burst of propulsion that's occurring. And this is actually where two-thirds of our power is coming from during the gait cycle. So it's a really important part. Um, I've highlighted that right here. Um, of the gait cycle. So this is just as we're going into um, push off here and then the very beginning part of the swing phase and it's it's a really important um, concentric action of those plantar flexor um, muscles so the gastrox and the soleus muscles. Okay what's happening at the knee joint? Knee's a bit more complicated. There's actually four different um, uh, important power bursts that are occurring during a typical gait cycle. So K1 is going to be the power absorption by the knee extensors, so that those are the quadriceps, just as a reminder. And at this phase of the gait cycle, when we're coming into heel contact here, you'll see that those um, knee extensors have to be nicely eccentrically contracting, so they're lengthening at this stage in the game. Um, and that's a really important part um, of the gait cycle because it allows us to um, make sure that we're um, controlling or breaking eccentric contractions are often thought of as breaking forces so we're really slowing down that gait cycle just for a very brief time um, just to make sure that we've got this nice controlled um, shifting of the weight onto that supporting limb and it gets us set up for that knee flexion um, during weight acceptance that's going to occur in the next power burst which is going to be K2. So now K2 is where we've got those knee extensors, they're going to be concentrically contracting and um, that's really important as we're going carrying on into the next phases of the gait cycle because we need to be able to extend the knee um, during mid stance 
to rays at center of mass. And so that's sort of what's happening at this next phase as we're coming from these two phases here. So now we've got an eccentric loading again of those knee extensors. So we're going back to eccentric contractions. And this is going to be prior to and just after the toe-off phase of the gait cycle. Um, just getting ready for that swing phase. It's really important um, that this is occurring because it gets us ready to propel that leg forward um, throughout that swing phase. And then finally, K4 is where we're doing a power absorption. Now this is going to be where we're flipping over to the hamstring muscles. So those are your knee flexors and they're going to be actually acting eccentrically. So imagine they're really important, that lengthening of the hamstrings just before you come into heel contact to make sure that you slow down that knee extension and get ready at that terminal swing phase. Um, just to get ready um, to make sure that you've got that uh, joint ready and stable before you hit the ground so you don't want your knee buckling. So that's the knee. Finally, the hip. Um, so now at the hip we actually have um, three different uh, phases of power that are typically reported in literature. I do want to just clarify though that um, the hip is actually where we see lots of individual differences here. So this is where it's um, you may see certain power bursts in some individuals and not in others. And I'm sure those of us um, who has a friend with a really interesting gait pattern, I had a friend in grad school and we used to call him Tigger because he used to bounce when he walked. Um, and we could see him literally across campus. We, could, we knew that it was Steve uh, just by the way that he would bounce. Um, and so for him, he used a very unique um, hip hiking kind of uh, idea when he walked. Um, he had some back problems, so he sort of adapted this, this gait pattern, which was quite unique. So we all know people like that. So these hip, these three hip births are where we actually see lots of individual differences for the ankle and for the knee. There tends to be pretty textbook cases for most healthy individuals. All right, so what about H1? So H1 is one of those um, regions where it's not always present. So it's a small region of, po of positive power. Again, not everyone will demonstrate this. And it typically corresponds to concentric hip extensor activity. That's going to be just at heel contact and during those initial loading responses. And that's really important for some individuals to make sure that that hip is nicely extended and ready for that weight acceptance during that first phase of the gait cycle. H2 is going to be a region of negative power. So this is going to be an, um, corresponding to an eccentric hip flexor activity during mid stance. And they have to be contracting eccentrically just to make sure that they're going to decelerate um, that leg that's rotating backwards. So here in the very first image, you can see their center of mass maybe just slightly behind that leading limb. And here you can see that that leg is going to be rotating back as you, as you sort of swing that trunk forward like an inverted pendulum. Um, <coughs> during the gait cycle. So that's going to be really important, um, that hip power burst, just to make sure that we're eccentrically um, contracting those hip flexors, just to make sure that that leg is um, decelerating appropriately. The final burst is H3. It is a concentric activity, and this is um, really important for the hip flexors. It's actually the second largest contribution of propulsive power during the gait cycle. Um, if I was in class, I would ask you guys, What's the first? And hopefully you would say, of course, it's that power burst, that eccentric power burst that's occurring right before toe off of the ankle. So this is the second one, which is H3. Really important to make sure um, that this is occurring just before toe off and um, also a little bit during that swing phase, the initial swing phase of the gait cycle um, to make sure that that lower limb is pulled upward and forward. Um, just to make sure that we're clearing the ground. So those are the hip powers. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in part two of um, today's lecture series where we um, look at some published literature in this area um, involving individuals with Parkinson's disease. So more on that later. Um, okay, with regards to how this could be used, so I wanted to highlight this paper. It was really a neat paper published in Journal of Experimental Biology in 2018. And the goal of this paper um, was actually to explore um, the question, can we, actually, um, can we actually change or modify how people produce power at the ankle joint? Again, really important, two-thirds of our power during the gait cycle. So we know that plantar flexor muscles are critical for this forward propulsion and swing initiation during the purse lock phase of gait. Um, but one of the things that they were finding, that the authors of this paper reported, and rightfully so, was that um, power output um, is reduced um, 
with aging. So as we get older, we tend to produce less power from the ankle. And um, it's also related as well, individuals with a gait pathology, you can also see reductions um, in these power bursts at the ankle joint. So one of the things that they were really um, setting out to do in this study was to see if they could actually um, design a protocol where they could try to change or modify those um, ankle power. And so um, just to orient you to this slide, they had individuals walking on a treadmill. They could um, real time uh, calculate the joint angle and that's, uh, I'll get to that in a second, the joint angle at the um, ankle is an instrument or treadmill. Um, so they could also record um, impact forces underneath the, underneath the feet as the individuals were walking. They were um, presented in front of them on this screen, a real time display of um, of their power and so just to get to that there's the moment at the ankle so they could calculate that real time um, and then this would also be the real time ankle um, for the um, uh, angular velocity and then of course uh, just taking the two metrics here the moment multiplied by the angle angular velocity they could calculate the power in real time at the ankle which is really cool they looked at the peak power output. Obviously, that would be typically towards the gate, the end of the gate, gate cycle, the stance phase of the gate cycle at toe off. And they could then report that as this dot on the screen in front of individuals. Uh, it was pretty impressive. This, this study is pretty cool. And they actually had individuals walking at their, what they call their normal velocity, whatever they felt was comfortable. And then they would report, obviously, this power of the ankle at that sort of normal gait. Um, pace that they would prefer, their preferred gait pace. And then they were curious to see if they could get individuals to um, reduce it by 10% or 20 or increase it by 10 or 20%, so plus or minus um, 20%. Um, and the, again, the whole goal of this was to see, wow, can we actually develop a training protocol where we could um, very quickly modify and change people's power output from the ankle? So what did they find? Well, first off, it was really interesting they actually could um, change it so you'll see in dark uh, the dark uh, black color here that's their typical or preferred gait velocity in the red is when they were increasing that um, power coming from the ankle and you can see that that was really successful both in the anterior posterior ground reaction force expresses a percent of their body weight and also the vertical ground reaction forces um, and you can see that in red they were also able to decrease that power here um, in the blue, the blue colored curves. So this is a really neat um, study. I encourage you to go check it out. It's um, free online. You can get it through Google Scholar um, if you don't want to log in off campus. And uh, again, the big take home findings here was that um, they could actually modify behavior pretty quickly just with um, some simple instructions and that biofeedback. And they feel that this might be um, a really great application of biofeedback training to restore ankle power in individuals, um, maybe older individuals or individuals with some type of pathology. So I think um, hopefully this was an interesting sort of application of power. And I want you to keep this in mind um, for part two when we come to our Parkinsonian gait. Okay, more on that later. All right, so what are three requirements for successful locomotion? Well, first, we had to be able to generate rhythmic stepping patterns to move our body forward um, in this progression. So that's really important for us to move through the world. Um, we also have to think about um, postural control and stability. So dynamic stability has to be maintained not only against um, for the force of gravity, but also following any unexpected or expected forces. So an expected force could be um, that you're um, anticipating um, you know, maybe being uh, jostled within a crowd and so you sort of may change the stiffness of your ankle joint muscles. Or maybe it's an unexpected force, so you experience a perturbation on a bus or something like that and you have to, to quickly um, regain your stability following that perturbation. We also have to be able to adapt our gait to changing tasks and environmental requirements. So really this is when um, the goals of the individual and or restrictions of the surrounding environment may play a role. So nowadays with social distancing, if you're following behind someone or maybe um, somebody's approaching you, um, maybe you might take a, uh, a, wider, um, a wider approach around that individual, making sure that you're maintaining that social distancing. Um, while also taking into account the restrictions of your environment, i.e. you don't want to fall off the curb into oncoming traffic. So it's those types of things where we can adapt our walking behavior. 
Okay, I did want to ha highlight um, some really cool research in this area uh, related to robots. So the first image over here is of Asimo, which was, I think, back in like 1984 or so, um, around that era. Um, this was Honda's, uh, one of their first foys into um, developing a humanoid robot. Um, the Asimo robot was 130 centimeters tall. Um, it was 37 uh, centimeters uh, from a anterior to posterior and about 45 centimeters in width. Uh, it weighed about 54 kilos. Um, it was pretty clunky, had sort of a rudimentary visual system, which was just like a camcorder that somebody sitting behind a computer could use. It was like almost like joystick control, that kind of idea. Flash forward a couple of years and you get HRP-4C. Um, this humanoid robot looks like um, a young woman. Um, and she actually, I believe, um, was in part of the Paris uh, fashion shows in the year that she um, came out first, uh, about 95 pounds. Um, she could sort of talk in a creepy voice and blink, um, that kind of thing. It was very odd. Um, so take a look online. You can see some, some pretty funny um, and interesting videos. Um, one of the big limitations was obviously um, battery powered and the ability to quickly adjust to changes in the environment. So um, not quite humanoid, but interesting research nonetheless. But I want you to think about these applications, these um, the individuals, the engineers and scientists that are um, behind the scenes trying to create these robots and the types of things that they might be thinking of when they're creating robots. So. Um, for example, this is another another example. It's uh, Atlas is the newest um, edition. This is by a uh, group down in Boston, and um, I love this YouTube video. Check it out. It's really cool. Um, they ask the question: Is it the most advanced humanoid robot with artificial intelligence? A lot of this research is being funded by the U.S. military, uh, which is a bit scary. Um, nowadays but um, but take a look I mean in terms of from an engineering and scientific um, standpoint it's so impressive um, but more on this later um, towards the end of the class anyways check out that video it's pretty cool so when you're thinking about all the the research that goes into this um, maybe one of the the first questions we need to ask ourselves is what are the requirements for a locomotor control system so if you were a systems design engineer how would you go about designing the best robot so first off you may need to set up an initial body posture um, and that's really important to make sure that they're stable before they initiate locomotion we did a big section in this class about initiation and termination of locomotion and um, one of the things that's really um, interesting and important is that we have to be able um, to initiate and terminate gate um, when and as needed so sometimes that's on the fly very quickly um, and sometimes um, you have a little bit more time to plan. I want you to remember um, some of the videos that we were looking at um, with the individual with Parkinson's disease trying to get onto an elevator and how challenging that was to initiate and terminate locomotion uh, when they wanted to voluntarily. So thinking of that. Um, also important to produce co and coordinate um, rhythmic activation patterns of muscles and limbs. So making sure that that's really efficient. You've got arms and legs moving um, in the same direction and moving you forward. Um, also important to maintain dynamic stability of your moving body. And again, thinking about those expected and unexpected forces um, that occur um, as we walk and move through the world. Um, and remember that walking and running essentially is like a series of different interrupted falls. We just have to make sure that we're um, coordinating those steps that keep us upright. Also important to modulate our patterns um, so that sometimes we have to alter the speed of our movement. Um, so we have to speed up or slow down to get across a crosswalk. We have to avoid an obstacle in our travel path like a dog running in front of us. We have to accommodate to different environments. So snow yesterday, those types of things, and changing travel directions quickly. So how do we um, do those things? Sometimes we have to guide our locomotion towards an endpoint that's not visible from the start. So think about how you might get from one part on campus, let's say the UC, um, over to uh, where you're having class in McLaughlin. So if you can't see that building, how would you get there? You have to sort of do some route planning. Um, also, we need to use minimal fuel to maximize distance covered before we have to stop um, for a break or to be replenished. Um, for this, I want you to consider the gentleman that, um, that James Christensen presented in his case study, um, where clearly his gait was inefficient for 
many reasons um, and think about how important efficiency is for him. Uh, one of the things uh, that James relayed to us was how tiring um, uh, this gentleman's gait was and how fatigue was such a huge issue for him. So thinking, um, thinking about that at this point. And finally, we need to ensure um, that structural stability of the locomotion um, apparatus is, is, um, is preserved. So, and that's just to make sure that we don't have permanent damage during your lifespan. Again, I'll, I'll um, encourage you to reflect back on James Christensen's talk where um, the gentleman that he was working with, his patient, um, didn't get the help that he needed initially and unfortunately developed a series of different compensatory strategies that were not, were not great for him. And so that's then subsequently led to um, all, a host of other um, issues and problems uh, with regards to his health. Okay, what about dangerous disability during walking? So for this slide, I'm going to walk you through um, different events, um, the phases of the gait cycle, where these events typically occur, and variables that we must control. Okay, so the first one is tripping. So you can imagine if you have an obstacle in the travel path and you happen to hit that with your leading um, foot, um, some of the where this typically tends to occur is during the swing phase of gait makes sense. Um, so perhaps you didn't um, hike that toe up enough. So now you've got some problems with toe clearance. Um, uh, and then of course following this, maybe you've got toe velocity issues and hip velocity and hip position. So you've got to somehow make these compensatory strategies um, to recover um, following that trip or that, that hit of that toe on that obstacle. Um, you may have to increase that hip hiking um, and really change that hip velocity just as a recovery strategy. What about if you were to slip? So this is maybe your lead foot comes into contact with some ice. This tends to occur during the double support phase of the gait cycle and really it's because we haven't controlled that foot velocity. So if we were walking really slow, perhaps it wouldn't be an issue. You wouldn't have slipped on the ice in the first place. But following that initial, um, that initial slip phase, now you have to think about, well, what's going on with that foot contact area? So do you keep your foot on the ground? Do you pull it up off that slippery surface? Um, that may require you to change your relative weight distribution from this foot um, to the trailing foot behind you. Um, with regards to falling, we can fall in all three different directions, so I'll break them up into the different directions now. So you could fall anterior, posterior, you could have some type of um, postural perturbation that um, causes you to, to lose your balance and either forward to fall forward or backward. This tends to occur in the single support phase and um, it, it tends to be the fact that we've got this large trunk angular acceleration in the anterior posterior plane. You can also fall vertically, so imagine if you would, you're stepping off of a curb and you just misjudge the height of that curb. Now suddenly you've got, um, and that of course would occur in the single support phase, now suddenly you've got to control that trunk um, vertical acceleration um, to make sure that you don't uh, fall down off of that curb and, and injure yourself. And then you could also have a situation um, where you're experiencing a medial lateral perturbation, let's say a shove in a crowd, that type of thing. Um, suddenly now, um, in that single support phase, you have to control the trunk angular acceleration in that medial lateral plane, potentially take some um, subsequent steps um, to regain your balance. So these are some dangerous disability during walking. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a slip paradigm um, that was used a few years ago now, but a really interesting one. So. I'll set this up. First off, the purpose of the study was to determine the reactive recovery responses um, used to maintain um, dynamic stability during unexpected slips, and then also how people adapt to repeated slip perturbations, and then to determine um, proactive strategies um, for whenever we're walking across a slippery surface. So this was the paradigm. They had individuals um, walking along this travel path. There were two force plates embedded in the travel path. Um, this is what they looked like on a cross-sectional area. So the force plate was underneath. Um, they had a roller's assembly, and this was like um, as if like in a factory. So um, they would actually, I'll come up here, um, this would actually be just underneath the surface, if you will, of this walkway. So the participants couldn't see it because they had um, sort of a mat that was over top of it. So they couldn't exactly see what was going on there. Um, and these rollers could either be locked or unlocked by the experimenters. So obviously in the locked position, a very stable surface to walk across. Um, if it was in the unlocked position, it would cause a slip because these rollers would move just like on an assembly line in a factory. 
Um, and the goal was to continue walking, even if they did have a slip, was to continue walking to the end of the pathway. And what they were really curious about um, was, yeah, just how we use our anticipation, how does the potential of slipping maybe change our recovery responses. So what did they do? They had 12 young adults. They captured EMG, kinematics, as well as impulses underneath the foot during this paradigm. And they also um, tracked the foot position as well um, in terms of both the heel and the toe as they were rocking across these rollers, both in the fixed and the um, free moving conditions. Um, what's really important about the study is that in some trials, um, participants were told that the rollers were locked, but actually they were unlocked. Um, so a bit sneaky. It was a deception study. So they termed this um, slip condition a no-knowledge condition. Okay, um, so um, one of the things I wanted to first say right off the bat is that, um, just to highlight the title of this slide here, knowledge actually will influence how people um, recover to a slip that's experienced during locomotion. So what does that, what does that mean? Well, they characterize the data um, according to a few different conditions. So first off, they're really curious about that very first slip and it was a really novel experience. And I can attest to the fact that it was really novel. I was in the lab when they were doing the data collection for this particular study. Um, and it really was quite shocking for some of the participants. It was really a cool study design. So first off, this is a kinematic profile here, the very first slip. You can see the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, um, and the slip actually occurred right here. There you can see the leading foot coming in, and there's the trailing foot behind. Um, you can see these dramatic arm responses, um, these sort of crazy knee flexion that's occurring. Like clearly this was a slip that was not expected at that point in time. What the researchers could do is they could actually capture that foot excursion. So they looked at the foot sliding on the rollers um, and they were trying to determine like what was what was that initial response that, that occurred. So um, one of the things that was really interesting clearly in this graph you can see that really large foot excursion here. Um, but then in subsequent trials that foot excursion was dramatically reduced and these are all young adults so they learned really quickly um, different adaptations to this perturbation, which was interesting. Um, I'm going to walk you through each of these conditions um, along the left hand side in one second, but first I just want to set up this graph. So this was that foot excursion um, that I talked about up here. Um, they recorded that in centimeters and they recorded it for trials where there was a slip present, yes, and when there was no slip present. So those rollers were locked, okay? Um, and they were, again, the, the researchers were really curious about how does the knowledge of the environment change um, your responses to, um, to these slip perturbations. So what they did was they had a couple of different conditions in terms of what they told participants. So first off, um, what they did initially was they had originally told individuals um, in uh, this green color right here. They originally were told, uh, they originally told participants, okay, you're gonna, in this trial, you're not gonna slip. Um, and then the next trial, yes, you, you may slip. You, or sorry, you will slip. So definitively, they knew. Um, so participants would be facing, um, facing the walkway. They would actually see the undergraduate research assistants like locking those rollers in place or unlocking them so they could actually physically see what was happening in the environment. Um, so when individuals were aware of what was happening, so the rollers were, let's say in this case, um, there was no slip, so they were locked. Um, they looked very similar to the second condition. I'll get to that in a sec, but they, they basically had a fairly large foot excursion, um, and it didn't really change that much when they had a slip. So when they were aware, individuals just sort of surfed across that slippery surface. So they just modified their responses using knowledge from that very first slip up here, um, where they would uh, just, you know, sort of surf across it and it wasn't that big of a deal. They just sort of remained their balance and just kept walking towards the end of that walkway. But they also had conditions when individuals were unaware of an impending slip. So for those particular trials, they had participants um, back on. Um, so they would be facing the opposite direction of the walkway where they had to actually complete the, the walk. Um, and they had those same undergraduate research assistants go up behind, uh, behind the individual, so again the participants couldn't see what was happening, and they would unlock or lock them. 
And so um, every participant for those particular trials, those participants would just start walking and have no idea if it was going to be a slip trial or non-slip trial. So what did they see? So first off, in the no-slip condition, obviously that foot excursion was really similar or pretty much identical um, to the knowledge condition. So they did have a fairly large foot excursion, um, even when there was no slip of about you know 25 centimeters or so. But when, when individuals were unaware of that impending slip, I had no knowledge um, if it was going to be locked or unlocked. What they actually saw was a decrease in foot excursion. Um, so as soon as it started to slip, because this would be a slip condition here, the rollers were locked. So obviously the foot excursion won't be anything different because it's just like a regular foot placement on a stable surface. So you wouldn't see any big changes there. But when they were unsure and they actually started to experience a slip so they could feel those rollers start to move, what they would do is they yank that foot off the ground. So that foot excursion value dropped dramatically. So this is a reactive response. As soon as they feel that foot slipping out, they pull up that foot really quickly, transfer their weight um, to the other foot and jump off of that slippery surface, which is kind of a cool response. Um, unfortunately, this work was never repeated um, like with older adults or any other um, particular population, probably for obvious reasons. Maybe it's not the safest perturbation um, strategy to use with those individuals, but a, a really cool study nonetheless that really just shows us that when we don't know what's coming, we have these really unique, as young adults, um, they have these really unique um, responses where they can just adapt really quickly, um, pulling that foot off the ground and getting themselves stable again. So kind of a cool study. Okay. Um, just with regards to age-related considerations, um, I did want to highlight um, some interesting research that's gone on in that area. So first off, we know that we do have deteriorations in balance control with age, which of course increases the risk of falls. We talked about that a few weeks ago. We also have evidence that subjects are, um, are able to actually incorporate useful adaptation strategies for safer execution of motor tasks, so older adults um, become really good. At, um, at adapting to, um, to their own capabilities and to the environment that surrounds them. And we also know that performance of these adaptations is highly task specific. So they'll um, adapt according to whatever they're doing at that time, which is a really um, unique and very, um, uh, very smart strategy to adopt. So um, this is a, an old study now, but a really interesting one um, that investigated slips in an elderly population. One of the reasons why they decided to look at this was because slips account for a high percentage of falls and injuries in community dwelling older adults, um, but they don't in young people. So um, they postulated that older adults may actually have difficulty in generating efficient reactive responses when they slip, and so that's what they set out to study. So the purpose was to examine these real, reactive balance strategies in older adults um, that were aged 70 to 87, so 32 older adults, and they also had um, young adults that were um, between 19 and 34 years of age, and they um, experienced an unexpected forward slip that would, would occur at heel strike on um, a motion platform system. So when subjects would walk across that movable force plate, um, it would simulate a forward slip at the heel strike, they recorded surface EMG from uh, both legs at the thigh, hip, and trunk muscles, and they also recorded kinematic data on the right side of the body, which was the perturbed side, so all right-footed individuals participated in this study. So what did they see? I'm going to orient you to the graph first. So this is for a young individual and an older individual representative um, uh, trials for this forward slip. Um, this is the height of the individual. Obviously, this is a kinematic stick figure. There's the distance here. Um, and this is when the slip actually occurred. Um, and that was true. Here's where the slip occurred for the older adults. Similar um, sort of setup for the graph. Okay, what did they see? First off, I just want to draw your attention to the arm movements here. So you can see, um, or sorry, to the trunk posture here. So for the young individual, you can see that the trunk posture doesn't really change even following the slip. So a nice um, upright trunk uh, with the arms sort of um, in front. You can see for the older adult here following that slip, um, they were going from a flex trunk posture to more of a hyperextension of the trunk. Um, and this was quite interesting and unique and it was only seen in the older adults. So after repeated slips, older adults actually um, became less stable um, and they demonstrated greater hyperextension of that trunk um, 
with respect to the young adults. Um, just with regards to those arm positions, again, just want you to draw your attention to the young individuals. Not a whole heck of a lot of change here, but for the older adults, they really do use that arm segment um, in their recovery strategies. So they found that um, a large arm elevation was frequently used by those older adults, and they postulated that this was to assist in maintaining trunk stability and to quickly reestablish the base of support um, for those older adults. Finally, they also um, drew attention to the foot placement. So I just want to um, draw your attention to it now. There's where the slip occurred. Um, that's the first foot placement for the young adults. And you'll notice how markedly different it is for your older adult population here. So after the slips, they found that the older adults had an earlier contralateral foot strike. So contralateral just means the opposite foot to what was perturbed. So this would be the left foot. Um, and also they had a shortened stride length. So it suggests a more conservative balance strategy. They're trying to put that foot down as quickly as possible after that perturbation. So you've got these um, trunk um, a hyperextension, you've got the large arm elevation, and an earlier contralateral foot strike with a shortened stride length. Um, and all of those are strategies that are used by the older adults to make sure that they don't fall. Um, so this is their recovery strategy. Okay, and finally, um, the authors also examined the postural EMG responses of older adults and found that they had longer onset latency, smaller magnitude, and longer burst, duration, burst durations compared to the young adults. And also, um, they showed a longer coactivation um, duration for the ankle, knee, and trunk agonist and antagonist pairs on that perturbed side and the non-perturbed side um, for the knee agonist and antagonist pairs. So in conclusion, um, this work really showed that older adults need com secondary compensatory adjustments, including a lengthened response duration and the use of their arms in order to regain their balance and prevent a fall. So a really interesting study. I hope you agree with me. Um, so that ends the first part, and we'll start off with the second part um, in a few minutes. Thanks.